All righty. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the second video of week six for the Thursday 8 a.m. section. I apologize if noise is a little crazy. Um, I am outside. Um, but um, this is after my office hours um, that I held um, during our like supposed section time. Um, so anyone is welcome to join me. Um, reminder, it's LSB 1101 at 8 to 9. Um, I'm also available on Zoom. I had some students drop by over Zoom, except I think it was mostly quick questions. Um, and also wondering where the video one was uh, because I was a little late today. Oh, well, uh, I did have one student that stuck around um, and we worked through some of the homework problems um, and just kind of like how to approach them um, on a whiteboard. So if you find that stuff useful, come visit me. I know it's early. Um, it is what it is, uh, but before I get into Patrick's method, which is the second part of this, uh, this video, because we're talking about prime implicant charts, I would like to talk about the last problem, which is covering Quinn McCluskey. Um, I'm never sure if it's Quinn or Quine, to be honest. Am I ever, is there a way to figure that out? Yes, it's probably very easy, but I, I like a little mystery. Um, so moving on, um, we have this final um, minimal sum of product discretion that we created, right? And we can actually check our work by doing the K-map mapping. Um, and so I have it already done up here, except I think there's something useful about doing it um, so that you guys actually see the mapping. Nope. Erase, erase. All right. This K-map corresponds to our original function in yellow that you see on the screen. Um, of all the midterms and don't cares are placed into this four by four K-map because it's a four variable function, right? And so we have our minimum, um, sum of products expression that we found using the prime McCluskey method and prime implicant charts. Um, and what I'm gonna show you is how to map um, all of these values to the K-map. So we start with this B naught C naught term. You can see that the columns here and here denoted by, just get rid of all the markers. Let's clean up. Um, this column and this column um, are represented by B naught because you can see the second bit um, in both of those headers are both zero and B is the second bit. Um, and so for the columns, we're looking for C naught and C naught is represented by these two rows. So if we wanna cover those two columns and those two rows, the grouping would be this for B naught C naught on a K map. Lovely. Now let's move on to C naught D. Um, C naught D uh, is going to be just an entire row because on our K map, um, these headers denote entire rows of C and D. And that is going to be the row I've highlighted there with an arrow. And it's represented by this rectangle that goes across horizontally. Now, A not, or sorry, A, B not, if I'll pull the read things correctly, that is represented by an entire column. And that happens to be this column here because you can see that A is high and B is low. And so A, B naught on our K map is represented by this vertical rectangle. And last but not least, we have A naught B C. And A naught B is represented by this column right here. It's our second column in our K map. And C is true for both of these rows right here because you can see that those values are high. Now, that means that A, B naught, or A naught B C is this grouping here. So we've now identified which of our terms correspond to what, which of the groupings on our K map. And we can see that all of our min terms are happily covered with the minimum number of boxes. Um, so they're the largest that they can be and there's the fewest boxes that we can use. And that denotes a minimum sum of products um, form of this expression that was a bunch of min terms and don't cares originally when we started out with. It. And the thing about don't cares and our final expression is that we use them if they're useful, like this don't care term here. But if they're not useful, like this, term here, it doesn't get a box because we simply don't care about it. So that's wrapping up um, Prime McCluskey method. Uh, and we are moving on now to Petrick's method. So what happens if Prime McCluskey, you make the prime implicant chart and it's not super obvious, which is the minimum sum of product um, form um, because there might be just a lot of horizontal bars going across and not enough essential prime implicants to narrow down your choices. That's where Petrick's method comes in. And also the thing about Petrick's method is that it's a systematic way to find all minimum sum of product combinations. And then it's easy to look at all the minimum sum of product, um, sorry, it's easy to look at all the sum of product um, that are in most reduced form 
um, of a function and then pick out the ones that require the least number of prime implicants. So how this works is firstly, we have this prime implicant chart here that is different than the one we were working with earlier. Just keep that in mind. And the first step is highlighted in purple. And we are going to make sure that we have no essential prime implicants and their min terms in our prime implicant chart. Um, because essential, the whole point of Patrick's method is finding out which combination of uh, prime implicants that are non-essential um, that give us the uh, most reduced uh, sum of product form. And so we know that essential prime implicants are obviously going to be incorporated into every single one of our most reduced forms of a function. Um, and so we just remove them. So uh, for example, um, this chart up here has prime, uh, essential prime implicants, um, P0, P2, and P5. And how you would remove them in order to prepare this chart for Petrick's method is by simply removing this row, removing this row, removing this row, and also removing all of the min terms that those rows cover. So that means that we wouldn't have 0, 1, 6, 8, 9, 11. And as you can tell, we're only left with uh, min terms 5 and 13 to figure out some sort of coverage. And that's why this problem was easy to do with Pi McCluskey, um, but a more complicated Petrix, uh, more complicated Pi McCluskey chart um, would require Petrix method. So I have one of those here where, in fact, um, there are no essential prime implicants to get rid of. So you can see that min term zero is covered by prime implicants one or two. Um, same thing for min term one, two, five, six, and seven. By the way, that's what these numbers are no, 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 up here is like uh, the min term values. So they'd be equivalent of like M0, M1, et cetera. And so um, the whole point of Pat Patrick's method is saying, okay, we want to cover all of our midterms, right, that are left over in this chart once the essential prime implicants that cover certain midterms have been removed. Um, and we want to figure out which combinations of prime implicants or Ps will cover those midterms. And we want all those combinations that cover midterm 0, 1, 2, eventually down to 7 to be, to be multiplied together um, because we want to cover all of those midterms at once. So this is how you do this. Min term zero, noted in red, you can see that prime implicant one and prime implicant two cover it. Um, that means that to cover min term zero on a K map, we could either put prime implicant one or prime implicant two, and it would cover min term zero. So keeping that or in mind, we have prime implicant one or prime implicant, implicant two, which could cover min term zero. Same thing for min term one, except instead of prime implicant uh, two that covers it, it's prime implicant three or prime implicant one. So I'm going to do that, fill this in for prime implicant two, or sorry, for min term two right here, it looks like P2 and P4 cover it. So that's P2 or P4 could fulfill uh, min term two for P5. Um, that is this grouping right here. That is P3 and P5. So P3 or P5 could be used to cover min term five. Lastly, for midterm six, we have P4 or P6. And for midterm seven, we have P5 or P6, which could cover midterm seven. So now, name of the game, Boolean simplification. And it's very easy <laughs> to mess this stuff up. Um, but we'll go slowly and hopefully, uh, will we go slow? You can always pause the video. Um, but I'm going to kind of try and show you the speed at which you should be going, but also checking your work. So we'll go a little fast. <laughs> I was like, we'll go slow. Yeah, it's like, I lied. So we're going to be multiplying out um, in terms zero and in term one in the expressions that cover it. So that's going to give us P1 plus P1, P3 plus P1, P2 plus P2, P3. All I'm doing is multiplying out um, M0 and M1 expressions. Now let's cover M2 and M5. And that's going to be P2 and P3 plus P2 and, oop, that's not a two. That's P2 and P5 plus P3 and P4 plus P4 and 5. Speedy. Okay. Last but not least, midterm six and midterm seven, we're going to be getting an expression that equates to P4, P5 plus P4, P6 plus P5, P6. And then lastly, P6 multiplied by P6 is the self. So that's a six. Now, we have this expression 
that we've um, basically reduced our uh, formula to. My iPad is a bit laggy on my screen. I think that's because I zoomed out too fast. We went too fast. We were too much of speed demons. Hold on. Okay, I had to pause the recording and get it back, but I think I think she's back. Um, so uh, we're going to reduce. <laughs> that's hilarious. Uh, we're going to reduce our expressions um, and continue to simplify. So if you remember from uh, Boolean simplification, um, anything uh, that has this P1 term in it, uh, we'll get rid of it. Because if we factor out P1, we'll be left with 1 plus P3 plus P2. And this will just evaluate to true. That means I can simply get rid of this term and this term. And we can do the same thing for this tail end uh, product term. So we have P6. Anything with a P6 in it is going to go away. Thus, we cross those terms out. All right, more multiplying out. So we're going to be multiplying out P1 and P2 and P3 by this whole secondary expression here. So I'm going to start by multiplying in P1. And so that's going to be P1, P2, P3, or P1, P2, P5, or P1, P3, P4. I think that's a four. And then P1, P4, P5. All right. Now we're going to be multiplying in instead of P1, P2, P3. So P2, P3 multiplied by itself is itself. <laughs> P2, uh, P3, P5 plus P2, P3. That is not what I would like. P3, P4 plus four terms P2, P3, P4, P5. All right. I am going to not copy it, doesn't look nice. Simply tack on this P4 and P5 product term plus P6. Um, we didn't touch it. Um, we will in a bit, but let's reduce. So I see we can do the same trick that we have this P2 and P3 here. So anything with P2 and P3 in it, let's cancel her out. This term has a P2 and a P3 in it. So does this one, and so does this one, and so does this one. So let's clean things up. Let's clean things up a bit. And we have P1, P2, P5 plus P1, P3, P4 plus P1, P4, P5 plus P2, P3. And that's all going to be multiplied by this guy on the end. OK, so hang in there. We are going to be ignoring that and multiplying this entire uh, expression by P4 and P5. And that's going to give us P1, P2, P4, P5 plus P1, P3, P4, P5 plus P1, P4, P5. That's basically itself because multiplying it by a term it already has is a redundant use of your time, plus P2, P3, P4, P5. All right, we're doing the same thing, except instead of multiplying that entire expression by P4 and P5, we'll do it by P6. So that is going to be P1, P2, P5, P6, plus P1, P3, P4, P6. That doesn't look like a four. That looks like a six. So that could get a little confusing. And uh, we'll continue on with multiplying out P1, P4, P5 with P6. And last but not least, P2, P3, P6. All right, this is our whole expression that we're working with. We can definitely reduce. So I see two terms. Um, uh, prime implicant combinations that are only three prime implicants long um, and anything that has all those three prime implicants. And what I mean by anything, any prime implicant combination, um, you can also cross it off. So uh, P1, P4, P5 is covered in this one, this one, um, and this one, and P2, three, P2, P3, P6, these are all, can't cross anything else out with that. So. Our final expression, all the potential minimum uh, sum of product uh, forms of this kind of like a chart that represents a function that we originally started out with, um, that is going to equate down to a combination of P1, P4, P5 will cover all of your midterms, or I'm just going to do this because I am lazy. P2, P3, P4, and P5 will cover all your midterms. P1, P2, P5, P6, all those prime implicates will cover all your midterms. 
Same thing with this combination here, prime implicate one plus prime, uh, prime implicate three, prime implicate four, and prime implicate six. We'll cover all your midterms. And last but not least, P2, P3, and P6. We'll co cover all of your midterms. Now, what we want to do is find a minimum combination, right? And so you think minimum, you want least number of prime implicates as possible. So you want prime implicates that cover multiple things. And that's really easy when, since we just did Petrick's method to see that this prime implicate combination and this prime implicate combination provide the most coverage as far as making sure all your midterms are covered by um, all these expressions. Because each of these prime implicates, don't forget, they correlate to certain expressions. So we have P1, P4, and P5. Uh, that prime implicate combination, whoop, I'm going to denote with purple. So P1, P4, P5. And also we have prime implicate combination um, P2, 3, and 6. And I'll denote that in blue up here. So combination of 2, 3, and 6 will also cover um, your entire uh, original function that this prime implicate chart represented. Um, and that original function, if you want me to write it out, it looks like this. Uh, F equals min terms 0, 1, 2, 5, 6, 7. OK, we're super close. So they are already in this chart. They put the um, pairings uh, algebraically of what each prime implicant corresponds to. And so we can use that to our advantage. So we know that the purple combination, um, we'll call that um, minimum sum of product one. Um, that is going to be P1 along with P4 along with P5. Um, that is going to give us the expression A naught B naught plus B C naught plus A C. So this is one potential minimum sum of product. And that's associated with that there. And then we have P2 with P3 and P6 that if using um, the blue uh, markers over here on our original prime implicant chart, we can see that P2 plus P3 plus P6 is going to equal, try to keep everything within one square, um, A naught C naught plus B naught C plus A B. So a little messy, but you know, when is, it 15, when is 15 A naught? Um, these are your two, final minimum sum of products that your original uh, group of midterms can equate to. So our answers are this one or this expression will successfully cover our original sum of midterms one, two, five, six, and seven. All right, that is how you use Petrick's method in order to find minimum sum of product. Um, Thank you so much for sitting with me through this second video. Um, I sent out your weekly form already um, or your attendance credit to get attendance credit. And so fill out um, just the second to last question. That's kind of like the one that'll get you attendance credit points um, as far as name something that you learned from watching my videos, something that you didn't understand from my videos or what you wish my videos would have covered. And one to, do sen one to two sentences will be fine in that regards. So. That is Patrick's method. I will upload my section notes and I think maybe my section videos, but I don't know, Gotcha Space is MP4, so it might be a YouTube video. I might become a YouTuber. Um, I will upload that to Gaucho Space and also on Gaucho Space and in the email I sent you out should have been your quiz solutions. Um, so best of luck studying for the midterm. And if you have any questions or you really feel like you're struggling concept wise and you wanna reach out, try the Gaucho Space forum or send me an email. All right. All right. Best of luck and have a great day.